Welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Last episode encapsulated the first half of 1962, where I have flown Gemini for the first and second time, and it was a lot of fun. Our first EVA just dangling above the earth on that tether was great fun. Uh, we've since fixed the jetpacks, so it's possible we'll see them being used. Uh, in the same amount of time, the Soviets have launched a few lunar landers of the three of them, only one has succeeded, so uh, victory there, I, I guess, not really. But uh, something else that is really worth noting is Beardy's Mars probe has regained contact with Earth. That's right, he transmitted pictures of Mars back to Earth. He beat us there as Markiner 1 still does not have contact with Earth. But enough introduction, let's get to it. So, I have estimated that we're probably going to need 10, if not more, million funds to unlock everything we need to land on the moon, possibly less if we don't upgrade the vehicle assembly building. So we might hold off on that for a little bit, I'm not sure. But just as valuable as money is as a resource is time. That sentence probably didn't make sense. But I would like our research speed and our build speed to be just a little bit faster and that costs quite a lot of money. Uh, so what we're going to do is only spend 600,000. We're spending 600,000. That should be good enough for us to complete some really big contracts to get us the funding that we desperately need. So let's go ahead and slap all of those points into rate one VAB, we're at 4.625. And the rest is going into our research and development, 1.012 science per day. July, 1962. The United States Air Force begins to conduct a series of nuclear tests in response to the Soviet Union's terror bomb demonstrated earlier in the year. Defense against ICBMs are of great concern to the United States by any means necessary. Partial from the space program, under codename Operation Fishbowl, the US Air Force launches nuclear-tipped Pathfinder missiles from islands southeast of Hawaii, detonating them in the upper reaches of the atmosphere and in space, thought to disrupt incoming missiles. This would artificially cause an observable aurora apart from the bright explosion in the sky. Sounding rockets strapped with instruments are launched into the resulting electromagnetic pulse and measure whatever data they find. This EMP was so strong that significant electrical damage was discovered in Hawaii, roughly 900 miles away. A handful of tests like this are conducted throughout the entire year, beginning in July. August 7th, 1962. The Catalyst C sees its first flight operation today counting down to launch Explorer 9 to the planet Venus. May of last year, Markiner 2 flew by the alien world, close enough to begin to feel its atmosphere, but not close enough to really obtain an understanding of what lies beneath its thick layer of clouds. Well, the Explorer program has ambitiously taken on this very goal, aiming to send a small spacecraft deep into the planet's atmosphere. And midday, the Catalyst C is away. Burning through its fuel, Catalyst C is detached and we are now introduced to a new upper stage, also flying for the first time today, called the Ajana. This relatively small rocket stage sports two ignitions and enough fuel to hopefully propel Explorer to its destination. Successfully in orbit, Ajana will now wait over an hour before lighting its engine once again, this time to leave the Earth for good. It is difficult to determine what can or cannot survive the conditions that await beneath the clouds, especially at interplanetary speeds. As such, new high-tolerance heat shields have been developed to theoretically allow survivable entry, although wind tunnels and thermal tests can only show so much. This will be the real deal. When the time is right, Ajana lights its engine for its second and final burn. Explorer 9 is away.
A Jaina successfully burns through its propellant, and telemetry streams back to ground control, who react with dismay. It's clear the craft has overburned by less than a second, and a slight fault with its gimbal as the last of the fuel ignited caused the Jaina to enter a rapid spin. Explorer 9 is tumbling away from the Earth, and a Jaina must use its precious mid-course correction fuel to reorient itself properly. Eventually straightening out, the numbers don't look good at all. The mission just doesn't have the fuel to bring itself back on course, even after using every kilogram of RCS fuel on both the Ajena and Explorer itself, save for the minute quantity needed to orient its solar panels properly. The probe will pass, frustratingly, 486,000 kilometers from Venus. Despite a nominal performance of the initial launch vehicle, the mission has failed. Well, as unfortunate as that was, we still have a plan, as the Venus window hasn't quite left yet. So we are going to build another lander. This time, uh, we're going to switch up the launch vehicle and add some things to the upper stage. We'll talk about that during the mission, but that's Explorer 10 here. Explorer 10 is going to the forefront of our build list. And as much as it's a waste of money, we're rush building it one time. September 6th, 1962. Today, Explorer 10 will attempt what Explorer 9 intended to accomplish last month. As 9 will end up missing the planet entirely, 10 is up to the plate. Another Venus window won't open again for just under two years, and as such, the desire to give this mission another shot is strong. A new identical lander was produced, this time fitted for launch aboard the Chiton 2, borrowing Algol boosters from Scout in Wallops, Virginia, just for a little boost off the pad. The time to launch arrives, and Chiton 2 lights its engine. Jaina performs the orbital insertion perfectly, arriving at a 186 by 184 kilometer orbit. The Chiton 2 provided enough thrust to lift the now heavier Ajana stage. On board is a secondary propulsion unit for final velocity adjustment, adding extra weight and necessitating a more capable launch vehicle. This is deemed necessary as it will allow Explorer 10 to target Venus with much higher accuracy, greatly improving the chance of success. When the time is right, Ajana lights its engine once again, destined for another world. The burn is successful, and telemetry suggests they have an encounter with Venus. Now the secondary propulsion unit will fire along several latitudes to finalize the precise velocity needed in order to enter the Venusian atmosphere at a theoretically shallow angle. It is thought an initial parasite of roughly 100 kilometers might be best, but in reality, there is no way of knowing what will happen until it arrives. Explorer 10 is released from the Ajena, orients its panels, and sits tight for its 79-day journey through the black. Those back home are eager to find out what the mission uncovers about Earth's sister planet. Without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours, there is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind, and its opportunity 
for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. September 12th, 1962. John F. Kerman makes a 30-minute speech forever encapsulating his goal for the space program and the United States as a whole, kicking the exploration of the unknown into high gear and revealing its most ambitious goal of sending Kerbals to the moon. Satellites in orbit have provided communication across the globe, navigation for ships, weather forecasts, and countless other improvements to Kerbal kind through the necessary advancement of rapidly evolving technology. Space probes serve as a fantastic first look at new worlds, but it is truly only providing a path for Kerbals to follow, and this path must be traveled, and it must be soon. The Gemini program will strive to be Kerbalkind's first step away from the Earth, awaiting on the technological development of bigger and greater things. October 1st, 1962. Wallops Launch Facility sees its third launch of the year, rolling out a Pathfinder meant to place a communications test satellite into high orbit of the Earth. The orbit this satellite, OSC-2, is required to enter will necessitate the addition of six Alcohol-2 boosters, Late in the evening, the mission is go. Problems with avionics immediately put Pathfinder into a tilt, followed by an overcorrection moments later that compromised its structural integrity, ripping the vehicle to shreds in a fiery explosion. Shrapnel and burning material rained down on the launch facility, causing quite the mess to clean up and the mission, without argument, has failed. OSCS-3 will intend to attempt the operation as soon as the cause for the problem is identified and accounted for. Back in Brownsville, it is only 11 days until our upgrade of the tracking station, and let's see what happens when we get here. Markiner 1, no freaking way. We have communications with Markiner 1 again. This is the exact same thing that happened when uh, Beardy upgraded his chem station. His first Mars probe lost contact and he regained contact with it once again after doing that. And let's take a look here. Uh, off to the side here, this is Markiner 2. And would you look at that, Markiner 1. We have stable communications. Everything is being transmitted, if not already has been. And actually our communications with Explorer 9 and Explorer 10 have increased a lot. They were starting to yellow already here, which makes me think I didn't quite give us enough comms range in the editor, but our upgrade of the tracking station should hopefully negate that. Now this is Explorer 9, the mission that is going to fail its mission. It will arrive in now 44, 45 days, 44 days. Explorer 10 is arriving in 42 days. So <laughs> even though it launched a month later, we're actually arriving at Venus uh, four days earlier than Explorer 9. So that's fun, and I really hope our communication stays this good as we arrive. That should be fun. That is, that is fantastic news. We've gained a few upgrade points from Markiner 1's flyby now, so all six of these points we're going to slap right into R&D and get our R&D speed just a little bit higher. Worth noting here, we still have the Mars flyby contract not completed, and that's simply because we didn't have the vessel loaded in scene as it flew past Mars, but we've gotten all the science from it that proves it was there and we got communication from it. That completes this contract. So Beardy actually had to do this exact same thing. We go into contracts, active, oh, let's see, Mars flyby, we have to force complete this to actually complete it. Otherwise, it simply won't happen. So there we are. We've got plenty of funds now. That is absolutely fantastic. Check the archive. Just double check. Yeah, I selected the right one. We're all good. October 16th, 1962. Discoverer 5 has signaled to ground teams that its film has run out. 
all being fed into its return capsule, and is ready to receive the command to jettison. Discoverer 4 has not sent the same signal, as for the majority of its active mission, sensors have indicated a problem with its feed mechanism. It is honestly unclear whether or not 4's film is corrupt, but there's only one way to find out. Both Discoverer satellites will first raise their treacherously low orbits to perform a deorbit burn. Then, they will jettison the recovery capsule containing the camera's film, before quickly orienting prograde once more to boost itself back into orbit. The Discoverer satellites will still perform scientific measurements and provide a platform for relaying communications in Earth orbit for several years to come. Four's film canister re-enters the atmosphere first, targeting the Gulf of Mexico for recover. It will soon be discovered this re-entry burn was more effective than anticipated, bringing the film's trajectory short of the Gulf. It's deducted the film capsule may in fact be entirely empty, although other causes cannot be entirely ruled out. The unfortunate fact of the matter is, Discoverer 4's film, if there, has ended up falling into the rainforests of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, quite possibly unrecoverable for some time. Discoverer 5 releases its film canister several hours later, targeting the Hawaiian Islands to allow the US Navy ample recovery zones. The film collected from this satellite unearths some uneasy truths. Bustling activity at both Soviet launch facilities, ICBM assembly and transportation, and most alarming of all, missile silos erected in Cuba, just south of Florida. This comes as a huge surprise to the United States, despite their own missile silos currently standing by in Eastern Europe. What follows is a nuclear standoff between the two superpowers. All it would take is one push of a button, one pull of a switch, to initiate what would likely become assured mutual annihilation. The world awaits in eerie silence, seemingly on the brink of nuclear war, yet hoping for a peaceful resolution. November 6th, 1962. During the anxiety-filled weeks that follow the previous discovery, the crew and staff preparing Gemini 3 do their best to remain focused on the task at hand, and what a task it is. President John F. Kerman has tasked the Gemini program, despite its limitations, with preliminary lunar exploration. The Trinity program will follow, picking up where Gemini left off in the Department of Exploration. Though Trinity is far from ready, as it is only in the early stages of development at this point in time. Eileen and Peter, heroes of the American space program, report all systems are go, and the mighty Cadern 1 lights her engines, rising into the starlit sky above. Today will be its second flight aiming to send a crew further than any Kerbal has ever been from the Earth. Gemini 3 will follow in the footsteps of the many probes before it, and dare to achieve what nothing has before, soaring past the moon and returning to the Earth. Despite its distance from the surface at this point, the separation between Stage 1 and Stage 2 of Cadern can be clearly seen from the launch facility in Texas. From their point of view, the event engulfs the entire vessel in a brilliant flash for but a few moments. All eight engines of the first stage performed nominally, and all six engines of the second stage have ignited right on time. Stage 2 of the Cadern 1 adjusts its inclination and angle of attack to provide Kentar, the third stage of today's flight, adequate time to insert Gemini 3 into its target orbit. The second stage separates, and Kentar is on its way. Burning through two-fifths of its propellant, Kentar shuts down, Nearly 14 minutes from liftoff, orbital velocity has been reached, 
and control has now been handed over to Eileen and Peter, who report that all systems are still go. Specialized panels inside the spacecraft allow full control of the Kentar system for attitude, propulsion, and cryogenic fuel required to power the Gemini spacecraft on its long journey away from the Earth. That's right, fuel cells have finally been developed, burning liquid hydrogen and oxygen to keep Gemini's power-hungry systems running, and to keep the two crew alive and well for as long as it will take to come back home from this daring journey. Back on the ground, Flight Control reviews telemetry data and begins work plotting an orbital maneuver that will take Gemini 3 to the moon, something that probes have done time and time again, though this maneuver must be performed in such a way that the spacecraft will return to the Earth on its own, or by means of a second burn or mid-course correction, with very specific landing zones back home kept in mind. After some time, Flight updates Gemini's OBC with the parameters for the maneuver, which will propel Eileen and Peter on a trajectory past the moon and back to the Earth in two weeks' time. This is known as a free return trajectory, and will be the first time it is ever performed. The translunar injection is complete. Slight inaccuracy mandates two mid-course correction maneuvers to first reach the desired sub-5,000 km altitude from the moon, and second to target a specific entry angle into the Earth's atmosphere once leaving the moon, targeting the Pacific Ocean, just south of Hawaii, for recovery via the United States Navy. For the next two whole weeks, they will eat, sleep, and monitor systems, performing various activities when instructed, as they observe the Earth slowly decrease in size, and will observe the Moon doing the opposite as they get closer. Two and a half hours from liftoff, and the first orbital correction maneuver will now take place. Kendar's fuel is ulaged and briefly lights his engine for the short burst, and it succeeds without fail. Gemini 3 is now well on its way to the Moon. Both Gemini 2 and many previous satellites have conducted tests determining the levels of radiation that should be expected when passing through the Van Allen belts around the Earth. The previous Gemini flight concluded it would not be dangerous so long as the time spent in its regions are kept to a bare minimum. Blasting its way through them towards the moon, Eileen and Peter report back to ground teams below that they have experienced no ill side effects from moving through the belts apart from seeing small flickers of light in their eyes, which they claim do not hinder their ability to work and are causing no pain. For the first three days in space, the Gemini spacecraft is placed in a slow idle rotation, dispersing the relentless solar energy constantly directed towards it. For these few days, no problems arise that cause any alarm. Halfway through day three, however, Eileen and Peter both experience discomfort, headaches, and flashes of light in their eyes that, unlike before, are interfering with their ability to see their checklists and the many switches in the capsule. Flight Control believes a solar storm is occurring or has occurred, waves of radiation being hurled through the Gemini spacecraft and through its occupants. Gemini 3 is instructed to immediately orient their spacecraft away from the sun, the best they can at least, as their view of the stars is while being hindered at the moment. This will place as much material between the sun and the recovery module as possible, making it more difficult for the deadly particles of radiation to reach the crew on board. This orientation will be now maintained for the majority of the remaining flight. It's not clear just how effective the precaution will be, but the spacecraft is not fitted with any worthwhile protection from solar flares in any other orientation. Luckily, the event comes and goes in a matter of hours. Eileen and Peter's symptoms subside, but do not leave entirely. They will from now on perform more frequent medical checkups with ground control, praying that they make it back all right. Flight provides the crew with the option to abort their mission and return home more quickly if they so desire. A single burn from Kentar would ensure they arrive home three days sooner than originally planned for. 
Eileen and Peter refuse this option, saying they will feel well enough to continue despite the unfortunate occurrence they endured. They have come this far, and they won't lose the moon. Three more days pass, and Gemini 3 approaches lunar space, the moon's gravity now pulling stronger than the Earth's. As the moon comes closer and closer, the crew observe and photograph its cratered mountainous terrain, passing by less than 4,000 kilometers from Earth's neighbor. It's an experience like no other. No Kerbal has been so close to an alien world until this very moment. The necessary orientation of their craft does not give them much time to observe the surface, however, and the crew expresses their disappointment about this, but agree on its necessity. The original mission plan would have them depress the spacecraft and perform an EVA while in lunar space, an addition added by the crew themselves, if not just for the spectacle, to give the crew some room to stretch out their legs in the open vacuum of space. Now, given their current circumstance, a change will have to be made regarding this EVA. There will be a 20-minute window of opportunity when the sun's light will be blocked by the surface of the moon, where the crew can step out and perform the spacewalk in the dark. With the previous tether-only method performed by Gemini 1 and 2, this would be out of the question. However, new technology in the form of a wearable nitrogen thruster pack should allow the Kerbinauts to maneuver freely in space, alleviating the awkwardness of the tether, although this tether will still be required as a safety precaution. Eileen is first to step outside into the black, viewing the Earth far beneath her. No Kerbal has ever seen a sight like this, and despite the perilous situation they find themselves in, it's a breathtaking view for both Kerbals. The Earth is so small, so fragile, just sitting there in the black among the cosmos. And on that world lies all of Kerbal kind, everything they are. And it dawns on Eileen and Peter that at this very moment, their history, in fact, their entire future, hangs in the balance. Should either side of the Cold War launch a dreaded nuclear attack they are so close to, it could be all over. It all just seems so helpless up here, knowing the Earth they left behind one week ago could be gone by the time they return, if they end up surviving this whole ordeal in the first place, that is. Peter is next up to spacewalk shortly after Eileen returns to hand off the single tether. He is instructed to perform a visual observation of the entire length of the spacecraft and the Kentar stage, looking for any micrometeorite or thermal damage that may be present. Nothing of note is discovered, and Peter returns to the Gemini as well. Shortly after returning to their spacecraft, sunlight creeps over the lunar horizon once again. Their brief window of safety is over, and relentless solar energy blankets their spacecraft once again. And Eileen and Peter again orient their spacecraft away from the sun. Not 20 minutes from returning to sunlight, from returning from safety, their headaches return, Flight control informs them a second solar flare is occurring and should last for another two hours, give or take. Their third mid-course correction is planned to take place in eight hours from now. So, should the sun behave, this burst of radiation should not interfere with the mission at large. The crew, however, must endure Sol's anger once again. The crew report milder symptoms during the second flare, and the mission proceeds on pace. Another change in planning begins with the Kentar stage's final burn, which it completes without fail. Gemini's trajectory is now sent on a direct impact course with the Earth, which will burn up Kentar. Meanwhile, Gemini 3 will detach from their ride and make the rest of the way back home on its own. In one day's time, a final mid-course correction will take place, using Gemini's ohms for precise plotting. They need to enter the Earth's atmosphere at a specific angle, else they risk disintegration if the angle is too steep, or bouncing off the atmosphere back into space if the angle is too shallow, of which both of those are deadly. They will be able to angle their spacecraft slightly once in the atmosphere, but control is very limited, so ensuring a solid re-entry now is what will count the most. Performing several maneuvers with the ohms, Flight believes Gemini 3 has entered a trajectory that will have them splash down just south of Hawaii as planned on liftoff. 
The Earth grows larger and larger as Gemini 3 screams through the space towards its point of origin and final destination. Approaching the Van Allen belts, Flight warns Eileen and Peter that yet another solar flare is occurring. This time, without the Kendar stage to block the radiation, more is bound to reach the crew. Although the symptoms experienced are reported to be mild, so pointing away from the sun must be quite effective, even with less material to use as a shield. Beginning to feel the burden of stress and struggling to ration the little remaining food on board. All that remains is to survive re-entry through the atmosphere, at speeds greatly exceeding anything ever done. The new heat shield technology is theoretically sound. Engineers and the Kerbinauts themselves have sound faith in the vehicle that was developed, as they are about to endure the most dangerous moment in the entire mission's two-week duration. Flight makes a final transmission before plasma blackout. Crack and speed, Eileen and Peter. We'll see you on the other side. On November 21st, 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis has since come to a resolution and both sides have withdrawn their nuclear missiles. The United States Navy Recovery Fleet spots Gemini 3 piercing through the atmosphere, the glowing streak of light traveling across the sky from horizon to horizon is hard to miss. Recovery teams make haste. Despite the darkness, the Gemini capsule has miraculously landed in its intended recovery zone in reach within a matter of hours. Eileen and Peter have done the impossible. They have flown around the moon and returned to the Earth. And what a harrowing journey it was. Both Kerbinauts are on medical leave until further notice. Due to the extensive exposure to radiation, it's not certain if they will ever be able to fly for the Foundation again. After the last two weeks, Eileen and Peter both share melancholy feelings towards this bad news. Despite the dangers, Neither thought it would be their last trip to space, but both know it was a hell of a trip to go out on. News of the event spreads like wildfire. The Americans are within arm's reach of the moon. Gemini 3, that was a hell of a mission. Oh my goodness, I, I need to catch my breath here, but after we recover the vessel, we, look how much funds, two and a half million funds. That was 1.5 that we got from uh, the mission itself, or maybe 1.6, I don't remember. We've got a lot of funds here. We've got a lot of science here just sitting there as well. But as you can see, we're still knocking through our uh, tech line here. We have some upgrade points from the science that was recovered or transmitted. I believe it was transmitted. All seven of these are going into our R&D speed. So it'll speed things up just a little bit. Just a little bit, every little bit counts. Uh, but I believe we'll be adding some more funds to this. Uh, let's see, crew report, telemetry, yeah, we didn't really recover anything, it was all transmitted. But look at that, we got an extra 24 science from recovering a vessel returned from a flyby of the moon. That's pretty cool. So we'll hit next there, you know, recovering the parts and the crew. You guys uh, have four XP gained, nice. Yeah, they gained a lot of XP, although I don't know I don't know if we're going to fly them. Uh, their lifetime radiation has gone up to about 64% for Eileen and 74% for Peter. That is dangerous. I think if, if we want to fly them again, it'll be after a while because they're on medical leave for right now. Uh, but if they return to spaceflight, they will never again leave the Earth. Uh, leave low Earth orbit. They will not go through the uh, Van Allen belts ever again because uh, we don't want to risk losing the crew, right? So we'll see what we can do with them, but we may be hiring another crew for another Gemini flight because we have Michael and Neil, uh, but we don't have anyone else now because they're out for the time being, understandably. So about our funds and science, let's take a look at some of the buildings here. Successfully completing the lunar flyby has unlocked us probably the biggest contract in the game. We scroll down here, 
to first human moon landing. Well, it's it's Kerbal, but the first moon landing contract. We are finally ready to put Kerbals on the surface of the moon. Look at that advance. Six or 6,750,000 funds and a completion of about 3 million funds. That is, that is astronomical and it gives us six and a half years to complete it. We're accepting this contract right now. Look at that. 9 million funds. And honestly, like all of that's going to disappear pretty quickly towards getting all of the facility upgrades and things necessary for the moon landing to occur. So yeah, that is absolutely huge. We also have orbital flight with at least three crew. We're not quite able to do this yet, although I think we might have Dinosaur able to do this before we have Apollo able to do this. So we'll see about that. We'll see about that. Otherwise, we have some Mars, Phobos, Deimos, asteroid landings. Those are all pretty lucrative, but I won't be accepting them quite yet. Now is when we start making moves. We have 9 million funds to spend, and that needs to go towards our infrastructure for lunar landing. Now the Saturn V is going to require a large launch pad. That's going to be the level 7 launch pad, the unlimited tonnage. It'll cost 2 million funds to build and take just over a year to complete. A hefty price tag for one important aspect of the lunar landing missions. I would like to build it. Yes, that's 2 million funds gone. The next one is going to be also huge, even bigger, is our vehicle assembly building upgrade to level 3. Our build queues will increase uh, from 25% build rate to 50% build rate, just an add-on there. So our speeds will get even faster than they are, and we'll also get the addition of a third build queue, which is very, very, very nice. So click. Let's see how long that is going to take. That's going to take only 193 days until we get that one. That is absolutely amazing. Now, the other thing that we're going to need to do before we can actually complete the landing contract is upgrade the astronaut complex to level three. I assume this will also take about the same time, maybe 193 days or so when I click that. However, I am not going to click that. We're going to wait on doing this until I have a little bit more spare funds to work with because otherwise I would bring myself down to 330,000 funds and I'd worry about running dry. So instead, we'll save some money for that one. We'll keep that one in mind. Something else that would be nice to upgrade is our R&D building. Another 2 million to do that. Our research speed is increased. Our research limit is increased. However, if we take a look at the R&D building, 116, yeah, we don't need that. We don't need that until after the moon landings for sure. And that's more shuttle tech stuff and station stuff. So our R&D building is set. Instead, with all of this money, well, not all of it, but a whole lot of it, I would like to address a pretty big bottleneck for our program right now, and that is our technology. We have a long list of technologies still being researched here, and we have a plethora of science just sitting here waiting to be utilized. So, 1 million funds, 50 points, and they are all going directly into the R&D building. All 50 of them up to 1.26 science per day. So that is going to be a huge increase to our speed for these nodes, hopefully. Uh, not extremely, but I think that was a good use of that million dollars because, I mean, all of this is taking so much time and we have the lunar landing stuff that'll come after all of this. Well, we'll probably interject some here and there, but there's a lot of tech nodes that we need to get through. And speaking of those tech nodes, First thing we're going to be spending all of this science on is grabbing the Apollo tech node, which will require docking and crew transfer to be unlocked before we can actually grab it. That also in turn gives us access to space station prototypes, which is pretty freaking awesome. This Apollo capsule, the reason I'm going for this first before any other Apollo things is due to the science experiment that the capsule has. Uh, science experiments, I should say. Uh, I believe there's at least three that can be run. Let's see, we got, yeah, a, a small handful of things that can be run in orbit of the Earth and possibly 
towards the moon or elsewhere, that'll get us a lot of science, so I would like to get that up and running before we're able to land on the moon, maybe do some test flights with it. And by the way, if you didn't catch earlier, we have a name for the Apollo program. I'm going to be calling it the Trinity program. So we have Mercury, Gemini, and Trinity, the third capsuled program with a crew of three. It's going to be called Trinity. I like that a lot. So let me know what you think about that in the comments below. But as for the remaining 172.5 science, we are going to grab early life support and ISRU simply because it will make keeping our Kerbals alive a little bit nicer. And I think that Apollo things might actually require this node uh, to be functioning. Don't quote me on that, but all the stuff that we're unlocking here seems like a good idea. Oh, and I did just now realize the launch escape system is here in the solids node. Ah, uh, do we need it? Do we need a launch escape system? I feel like we probably should grab it. It's an unfortunate use of our science, if you asked me, but wouldn't quite look right without it. And still, after all of that mess, we have no time to relax because Explorer 10 is approaching Venus in three days. So we have that to attend to. November 25th, 1962. After a very minuscule mid-course correction of 0.1 meters per second, fixing slight error along its trajectory, Explorer 10 has reached Venus, aiming to compound its knowledge of Earth's sister planet with data collected by Markiner 2 in May of 1961. Nearly 80 days have passed since the space probe lifted off from Brownsville, Texas aboard a modified Chiton 2. Now, six hours from impact with the Venusian atmosphere, Explorer 10 briefly ignites two small Mercury posigrade motors, placing the entire vessel in a gentle rotation. This will ensure Explorer stays aligned with its current attitude after all forms of control and power generation are jettisoned. Now all that remains is the communications dish, batteries, and instrumentation including a barometer, thermometer, and a camera, all protected by not one, but two newly developed heat shields, theoretically able to withstand the immense abuse they are about to endure, punching into the atmosphere of Venus. Approaching Earth's sister planet, its camera is able to capture images of its unique Terminator, a band of bright blue circling the entire planet at sunrise and sunset. As the probe passes overhead, at 9 to 10 kilometers per second. It will enter the atmosphere during the day, and luckily, in view of the Earth. This is mission critical, as although the probe has no active or passive form of control at this point, the Foundation would learn absolutely nothing from the mission if communication is lost. Its batteries, if they survive the ordeal, will only last for a couple of days at most. And now, it's time for the moment of truth, as Explorer begins to pick up readings on its barometer. The inferno surrounding Explorer 10 subsides, and as it does, connection with ground teams back on Earth is restored. The communications dish has survived, along with its supply of electric charge, and the instruments are now frantically collecting data from the new environment they find themselves in. Taking a few moments to analyze its data transmissions, it appears the atmospheric density of the planet was greatly underappreciated by nothing but the atmospheric friction, or drag, caused by gravity on the small one meter wide probe, it is determined the atmosphere is some 100 times greater than that of Earth's. Much to the rejoice of mission scientists, this means the probe will spend much longer than expected falling to the surface, allowing its instruments to extensively measure the atmosphere all the way down. Another noted feature, alarming to many, is the temperature inside the atmosphere. A temperature rising past the surface temperature of the Earth all the way up at 50 kilometers altitude and rapidly increasing past 200, 300, 400 degrees and hotter the lower the explorer flows to the surface. And the lower it falls, 
the slower it falls as well. The onboard camera records and transmits images of the layer of clouds, moving very quickly and violently below, gradually getting closer and closer, imaging what appears to be cracks of lightning violently traveling through them. It approaches and for a brief moment, the electrical systems go dark and telemetry stops responding. But not for long. Explorer 10 bursts through the layer of likely sulfuric clouds, revealing for the first time what hides beneath them, proving most every theory of the planet's composure entirely incorrect. There are no oceans, no jungles, nothing comparably Earth-like in any way whatsoever. Captured by its camera is a barren landscape, void of any signs of hospitable geography or ecosystems. The atmospheric sensor continuously indicates the air consists mostly of carbon dioxide, and the temperature continues to rise hotter and hotter as the surface below approaches. This data continues to stream back to the Earth until suddenly, at merely 5 kilometers altitude from the surface, connection is lost. It will never again be restored. It is assumed that one of two things have occurred. Either a line of sight with Explorer 10 was lost over the horizon of Venus, or the acidic atmosphere and insane temperatures melted the components of the probe. They will never know for certain. Meanwhile, Explorer 9 will pass overhead at a distance of 500,000 kilometers one day from now, entirely missing its intended target. Well, outside of the roleplay, we do get the luxury of seeing the rest of its life through and through as the probe did in fact survive all the way to the surface. And more than that, it survived touchdown as well. Several minutes pass before the comms dish actually melts away, and with it, any hope of communicating with it again. However, the atmospheric portion of this mission was a great success. This was a lot of fun. So I've made the decision after this success to spend another million funds on just research nodes. So now we're at the 2,600,000 funds. I'm gonna leave that amount of money alone because we're gonna need a lot of money still. But in the meantime, we have all of these points going into our research speed, bringing us to a total of 1.472 science per day, which is going to speed this up quite a lot. And with the 224 science we have now, we are gonna go ahead and unlock the J2 engine with 80, 1966 orbital rocketry with 60, and grabbing the F1 and the AJ-10 for 80 points. And now we should have absolutely everything necessary to land on the moon, except for this final note here, which costs 85, uh, the lunar lander itself. And as the year comes to a close, we still have one mission to attend to. Wallop's launch facility is going to close out this episode with a brand new little scout. December 22nd, 1962. The Wallop's flight facility has developed an improved scout launch vehicle with greater capability and theoretically greater reliability as well. Well into the wintry morning, Scout 6 is away. Solid's launch vehicle has performed flawlessly, and Scout 6 now sits in an eccentric orbit of the Earth, providing communications and transmitting orbital perturbation data. Mission is successful. 
And this concludes our adventure this episode. Lots of Cold War things going on, Lunar Gemini, landing on Venus technically, although we don't get the achievement quite yet. Uh, just all in all, a fun-packed episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you'd like to see what Beardy has been up to in the Soviet Union this half of 1962, the link to his video or channel should be in the description below. But I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.